thank you, Mr. Jewison, for talking with me today. Um, I'd like to start with asking you a question about how you're feeling about the racial reckoning that's happening right now. As someone who marched at Martin Luther King's funeral, you know, is a, a struggle for justice. But that's been going on for a long time. When I first went to the South, <clears throat> I was in, I was uh, getting out of the Navy, the Canadian Navy. I think it was 1945. It was the year the war ended. And I was being demobilized. So the first place I got to was Memphis, Tennessee. I got on this bus and it was a hot day. And there was a window open at the back. So I went to the back of the bus and, I, and where I would get some air. And then the bus stopped and the bus driver looked at me in his mirror. And he said, are you trying to be funny, sailor? And I, I didn't know what he was talking about. He says, can't you read the signs? And then I looked up and there was a sign hanging from a wire, colored people to the rear. And then I looked around and there was a couple of black people sitting near me. And then I looked up and all these white faces were looking down at me. So I decided I'll just get off the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and that will be my protest. And I was left standing on the side of the road in this hot, hot day. I think it planted a strong seed in me about social justice. Could you talk about working on the first black show in America in 1959? It was called Tonight with Harry Belafonte, and I'm curious how that impacted your career. Most American filmmakers started in television. And we were in the East, we were in New York. And, and uh, that was the center of all the networks. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with Harry Belafonte. And I asked him if I could uh, put together a, an hour musical special with him. And I think because he was so handsome, white people used to like him. There didn't seem to be any problem with the audience. And so I told CBS that I thought, I thought we could get a big audience. He met with Harry and uh, he said, well, I'd like to have some dancers, and I would like it to be mixed, black and white. I said, yeah, well, that'd be great. So we went, we did, made this show, and I thought it was going great, and I was sitting in the control booth, and of course it was live, and then somebody came up to me and whispered in my ear, we just lost 26 stations. <laughs> in the South because you mixed black dancers and white dancers together. But the show actually was very popular. So that was my first experience working with a black artist in America. What a lot of people may not know about Norman Jewison is that uh, he's a man who's fiercely committed to social justice. I've met very few people who have his kind of passion where it's just in every aspect of his life. We talk about the power of storytelling in the screen industry, and I want to point out three films, In the Heat of the Night, A Soldier's Story, and The Hurricane. They were all masterpieces and couldn't be more relevant today. And I'm curious why it became important to you to challenge the way cinema framed the Black experience. I was in uh, Idaho skiing the Christmas before I made in the heat of the night. And one of my kids was in a ski race and he fell and broke his leg. And another kid hit the same jump and he broke his leg. 
So I went to the hospital that they have right there in Sun Valley, and Bobby Kennedy, he was sitting there, and I walked in and sat down a few feet away from him. And then he said, what do you do? And I said, no, I'm a filmmaker. What kind of films do you make? I said, well, it's, it's a curious question because I, I'm just about to make a film about a black detective from Philadelphia who goes down to Mississippi to visit his mother and he gets picked up and brought to jail as a suspect in a murder that's happened in this town. It's really a struggle between a very smart, a talented detective from Philadelphia and a redneck sheriff in Mississippi. And that's essentially what the story's about. He said, this could be a very important film, Norman, because timing is everything. In life, and in art, and in politics, timing is everything. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say, last night about midnight? I think that was the first time that a black man slapped a white man in American cinema, and that's why when you mention the slap, it was a slap that was heard around the world. So I remember when Heat of the Night played in New York in front of a majority black audience. When that happens, they all burst into applause. <laughs> but in the Heat of the Night was, I think, my best film since Cincinnati Kid. Why would you say that was the best? Well, I, it was so believable. I think the performances were so real. You know, I had two brilliant actors. I had Rod Steiger and I had Sidney Poitier. As a matter of fact, Rod Steiger won the Academy Award. I do want to talk about another scene. The scene where Sidney and Steiger are having a couple of drinks at Steiger's place. The conversation's going in one direction and then it shifts to another. I'm really curious about what you were trying to say with that scene. I'll tell you a curious thing about the scene. The house that we were shooting in had a tin roof and it was pouring rain. And the rain on the roof made it impossible for us to shoot. So I was sitting in the car with the rain coming down with Sidney and Rod in the back seat. And I said, why don't we rehearse the scene? Because when it stops raining, I want to I wanna go in, I want to get this, you know. So let's rehearse it. So they started as it was written by Sterling Sillifant. And then I didn't say cut. So Rod Steiger started to improvise. Stuck in this small town. Nothing ever happens here, you know, nobody cares about it. Uh, you live alone? Oh yeah, I live alone. And then all of a sudden, Steiger realizes that Sidney is kind of feeling sorry for him. And that's when he blows up. Oh, now don't get smart, black boy. I don't need it. Pity, thank you. The scene where it was going along great between these two, all of a sudden is broken. But the sheriff didn't want a black guy feeling sorry for him. One of the first things you ever said to me was, Charles, look to the theater for stories. Charlie Fuller wrote the wonderful play. And I saw it in New York. I called Charlie Fuller and I said, have you ever thought of making this into a film? I would like to meet with you. And so he came up to Canada and uh, we worked together on the screenplay 
And that's the first time I hired Denzel Washington because I hired him in a smaller part. I found a location of an old military camp. It was in Arkansas. And so I had a friend in Washington and I called him, how can I get some help to shoot in Arkansas? And he says, well, you got to go to the governor and you got to get his blessing. The governor was Bill Clinton. And I remember going to meet with Governor Clinton. I told him what I wanted to do. And I wanted to bring a Hollywood crew and I need about a hundred black troops that are trained. And he said, well, I, w I just think it'd be wonderful if you could bring your film to Arkansas. And he pressed a button and he says, ask General so-and-so of the National Guard to come in here for a moment. So this uniformed general walked into the office. He said, Mr. Jewison is the director, very famous director from Hollywood. He needs about 100 or 200 black troops that are trained. And he said, well, there's no problem there. I'll just make a parade call for the uh, National Guard, uh, and then I'll send all the white boys home. <laughs> Your commitment and contribution to Canadian creators lives here in the CFC. And I'm wondering if there's anything you would like to say to filmmakers at this moment in time, from storyteller to storytellers. I think you have to find a story and that, that is true. Because truth has, uh, has a great deal to do with telling a, a story. And in doing that, you've got to have a raison d'etre. You have to have a, um, a meaning. Is it going to change people? Is it going to move people? You have to find the passion that you have. Uh, you have to channel it into telling a remarkable story.